Father God who art in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful yet again to open your word. Father, we know very well the texts. We want to know the experience. Your word says, O oh God, that spiritual things are spiritually discerned, that the natural man cannot even receive them because they are foolishness to him. Father, remove from us everything and anything that would hinder us from understanding what it is you're trying to say to us this evening, myself included. I pray, Lord, that you will grant us the spiritual teacher, the only effectual teacher of truth, your Holy Spirit. And may he guide us into all truth this evening is our prayer. Cleanse us, abide with us, show us your son, that by beholding him, we may be changed is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It's a privilege to be back here with you guys. Um, I was literally just earlier today going through the word of God and just looking at certain things that I wanted to share with you. As Brother Butler mentioned, this will not be our, our last, this is not a goodbye, this won't be the last meeting that we have with each other. As, as time unfolds, we'll be able to study more and to see more and to look into more. Um, but there's something I wanted to say before we got into the message for this evening. It is imperative, beloved, that we begin to spend time personally in our word. And those of us who already do that, it is imperative that we spend much more time in our word. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, that we are headed into a time of trouble such as never was. It's going to require an experience with Jesus such as never was. These wonderful uh, accounts that we find in the Bible were written as examples unto us and samples. When we read about Moses, we know that Moses lived as though he was in the sight of the invisible God all the days of his life um, from the day he met him. Amen. We know that Enoch walked with God and was translated. We know that Elijah went up in a golden chariot. Job was a righteous man, according to the Lord. Daniel was a righteous man. So many different examples of righteous men uh, found there for us in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Then you get to the New Testament, and there are even more examples. Paul, Philip, uh, uh, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all of them. None of those experiences are the experience that we need to go through what's ahead of us. I want us to be very attentive to what I'm saying right now. These are all wonderful men of God. It's wonderful to see what Daniel did and what the Lord did through him. Wonderful to see what God did through Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or as some of us may know them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Wonderful to see what God did through those men. But beloved, the experience that those men had in their day was enough to save those men and those who followed those men in their day. It will not be enough to get us through what is ahead. The experience that we need with Jesus will be one such as never was. The only safe place there is to look, the only safe person there is to behold, is the man, Christ Jesus. And I pray that during these studies that we've been having with each other, you've been noticing a, um, a repetitive theme. When we study together, it seems to always be Christ that we're talking about. And I, 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 I want us to begin thinking about that. Because if we're talking about Christ every single time we come together, and yet there's more beauty, more depth more loveliness, more peace to be had, more victory to be won. Every time we look at this same Jesus, then beloved, we can never exhaust the theme that is Christ, our righteousness. I, you know, often I, I, talk with, I talk with brethren that I love, and I love you guys, by God's grace, we're family. Uh, by now, I pray that you, you uh, receive me as Brother Paul Punch, I'm your family. I talk with brethren and I tell them all the time, you know, they'll ask questions like, do you have anything else to say about righteousness by faith? And my response is always the same. Brother, I have nothing to say except righteousness by faith. Because the more you study the word of God, you will see the importance of those words that Jesus said. Jesus said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. It doesn't matter to me what book we find ourselves in. It is Christ that we must see. Do you know that there are more people who study the book of Revelation, and though the book is called the Revelation of Jesus, we see more beasts and plagues than we ever see the man Christ. Beloved, I'm shooting straight with you this evening because I want us to understand that we have come to a generation where the views of the man Christ Jesus must increase in order for our experience to go any deeper. We can rise no higher in our experience than our conception, our understanding of who God is. And the only safe place that we can look to know who God is, I'm going to say it very plainly this morning. I'm talking to some of you, so I'm not, I'm not bashful. There, it's not looking to Pope Francis. 
Pope Francis may be the vicar of the devil. <laughs> You'll excuse my language. He may be the vicar of the devil, but he's certainly not the vicar of this same Jesus. The only place that we can look and with safety understand who our loving father in heaven is, beloved, is the man Christ Jesus. Hebrews calls him the express image of the father's person. It means the picture doesn't get any better than that. The picture doesn't get any clearer than that. You may read in the Old Testament and not understand God when you're looking at him, but when you turn to Jesus, Jesus makes the Old Testament braille for the man that does not understand. Beloved, I have no other message for you than the man Christ Jesus. I have no other place to direct your faith and your attention than into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to the man Christ Jesus. There is no other place I can direct you with the burdens that I know you have, because we have burdens in my family too. The burdens that I know you have are lifted by no one else than the man Christ Jesus. And I believe with all of my heart that as we lift him up accurately in this final generation, I'll say that emphatically, in this final generation, I believe that Jesus will draw all men unto himself. And the very fact that he will draw all men means that Christ alone is attractive. Do you know the Sabbath on its own is not attractive to a man that doesn't know how to rest? Do you know that dress for form alone is not attractive to a man that knows nothing but the fig leaves of sin? The, the, the health message is not attractive to a man who has not tasted and seen that the Lord is good, but Jesus in the Sabbath is attractive. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus in health reform is attractive. He says he can take away our filthy garments and clothe us with his righteousness. Jesus in health reform is attractive, whatever the doctrine may be. And we have many as seven events, beloved. We're not even going to get into all of that. Whatever the doctrine may be, if Christ is given his position as the best, as the first, as the last in everything we have, there is power to draw all people out of Babylon. And until we understand that, beloved, we can study the Bible all we want. We're missing the man. We're missing the point. We can study the plan of redemption all we want. If we're missing the man, we don't understand the plan. The plan has always been to receive the man Christ Jesus. And so this Sabbath, we're going to be talking about none other than the man Christ Jesus. I want to share my screen with you, but before I share my screen, I wanted to share three texts. The first text comes from Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38, where the Bible says, and these are familiar texts, I'm sure. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38, now the just shall live by faith. The just, that is them that are justified, them that are made righteous by the blood of Christ, the just shall live by faith. Beloved, what is the condition of your spiritual walk at this time? What is, the res what, what, is, what, what is it that we're looking at throughout the week as we are trying our best to live up to the light that God has given us? Are we alive or are we dead? The Bible says the just shall live by faith. So whether or not we have faith is a life and death issue. The quality of experience that you're experiencing now as a Christian is telling of the quality of faith that you now possess. If we are dying, we have no faith. But if we are living by the grace of God, that life is by the faith of Jesus Christ. What is the quality of your faith? The next text comes from uh, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, we're talking about faith. The Bible said the just shall live by faith. So wherever you find a Christian that is dying, you can be sure it's a Christian that lacks faith. And if we're dying and we want to live rather than die, what we need to figure out is how can we get this thing that the Bible calls faith? For the just shall live by faith. In the book of Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, the Bible says this, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, but hearing comes by the word of God. If we lack faith, we are dying. If we want to live, we need faith. And if we desire to have faith this evening, the only place we need to go, beloved, is to hear the word of God. Catch what the Bible says. Notice the Bible does not say to hear the words of men. I want us to understand that if I should drop dead by the grace of God, the word of God endures. 
It is the word of God that we desire more than anything. That word has creative power to transform us. It can transform a sinner like me. It can transform a sinner like you. But the Bible says the only way that faith comes is by hearing the word of God. How often are we in our Bibles spending time with Jesus on a personal level? For many Seventh-day Adventists and for many Christians, generally speaking, getting into Bible study is something we do on a Friday night, something we do on, on the Sabbath. And for those who are out in Babylon, sometimes, you know, it's just a Sunday service. They don't spend time in the word of God. And so from Sunday all the way through Friday, we are dying. And then from Friday to Sabbath, we expect God to, to rejuvenate us, to give us some life. And we try to live off of that little bit of life we have for the next week to come. Beloved, it is time for a better and a deeper experience. If we only live by faith, and faith only comes by hearing the word of God, then the reality is that the strength of our walk is a reflection of the depth of our communion with Christ. I'm going to say that again because I know it was a mouthful. The strength of our walk, if you're walking as a Christian, as a seven day Adventist, and you find yourself weak, the strength of your walk is an evidence to the depth of the communion you have with Christ. If you spent more time with Jesus, do you know you would find it easier to overcome that very thing you may be struggling with right now? If you spend more time with Jesus, the things that you love, Jesus would make them the things you hate. And the very things of God that we hate, Jesus would work it in our heart for them to become the things that we love. Brother Paul, why do I enjoy Bible study? My friend, it's because we don't spend time. G give it a try. It it's like, um, for example, uh, you know, my wife and I, sometimes we watch these videos on Instagram. And there, there are many videos where children will be given their first lemon or their first lime. And you'll notice whenever the child, <laughs> whenever the child is given a lime or a lemon, they bite it. And as soon as they taste it, it's like, oh, you know, I don't want that thing. They, 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 they make up their face, they grimace, and, and they throw it away for the most part. Some children are, 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 a little, uh, are a little different. They'll eat the lemon, all right? You know, the individuality will allow that. But the point is, when you taste something, it is then that perception is gained. The baby may be reaching out for the lemon the entire time because he sees the mother and the father eating it, so it must be good. Anything they eat must be good. But once the child tastes it for themselves and sees that it's not good to them, they no longer want it. Beloved, we have been tasting sin all of our lives. The Bible says we're born in sin. We're shaped in iniquity. It is, it is what we know. But beloved, there's something better we can try today. And the point that I'm trying to make is if we would but try the man Christ Jesus, just open the word. Just get into the Bible. If we would just start there, God would unfold to us the plan of redemption. He would unfold the beauty of the man. And in seeing Jesus, we would be drawn to God in a way that we've never experienced before. I've, I've had young people talk to me before and they, they'll tell me, you know, I'll ask them, when, when, are you, when are you seeking to get your life right with God? When do you want to serve the Lord with all, with all that you have? And many of us, we look to uh, one of my good friends, Brother Sheldon, he mentions this all the time. We use the story of the prodigal son as a reason why we want to dabble in the world for a little while and then later on in life, get our act together. Beloved, let me tell you something. The prodigal son experience may not be yours. The thief on the cross experience may not be yours. We have only today right now somebody somebody you know you know many times we're talking about the the the, the close of probation and when that happens the close of probation for seven adventists i'm going to say this very plainly i haven't studied it with you i'm telling you but i'll study it with you later the seven day adventist close of probation for individual seven Adventists, begins at the passing of a national Sunday law. It is then that we are tested. It is then that we are reviewed. The judgment of the cases of the dead will pass to the judgment of the cases of the living at the passing of a national Sunday law. How do we know that? Because it is that test that determines whether we have the mark of the beast or we have the seal of God. Those that are marked never become sealed. Those who are sealed never become marked. It is the point of no return once the decision is made at that time. And what I want us to understand about that, beloved, is that if we're waiting for a Sunday law to get our lives together with Jesus, do we understand we can die tonight? God forbid. Satan is not playing with any of us because he is afraid not only of the message that we're studying, beloved, please hear me. Satan is not just afraid of the message we're studying. He's afraid of what happens to the people who take hold of that message personally in their experience. Satan knows that the last time the things we're talking about became the reality of somebody's life. His name is Jesus. The last time that happened, the beginning of the crushing of his head began. 
And if God gets a hold of his people in this generation to the same extent he had a hold on Jesus, if we would follow that man in the same way he lived his life, Satan knows the game is over. Satan knows that this thing is over, beloved. And so this evening, we're going to be talking about something uh, that I've entitled Stand Fast in Liberty. Let me know if you can see my screen, please. Uh, anyone? Yeah, you're good. Praise the Lord. Just, uh, stand fast in liberty. The Bible said we are to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And what I want us to understand today, beloved, is that it is impossible to stand in the liberty that God has given us unless we first understand that liberty for ourselves. And so we began in our last study looking into that liberty and understanding it for ourselves a little bit more. We're going to be analyzing today Christ, our champion. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I come from a background of boxing. I was very heavy in competitive sports and boxing was, was my thing. That, that's what I really enjoyed. I loved it. Th that's where I was. That's where my mentality came from. And I remember that when, you, when, when, you're, when you're boxing, can you imagine a man fighting for 12 rounds? It's just an analogy. Fighting for 12 rounds and every single round, the man loses the fight. You go into the ring round two, you get beat up. You go and sit back on the bench. You go back in on round three, all the way to round 12, and you didn't win, not one round. That man must be exhausted and discouraged and loses the desire to continue in the fight. That's the natural result of losing, beloved. Nobody wants to be a loser. If, if we're honest with ourselves, especially in a spiritual sense, nobody wants to lose. We're tired of feeling beat up day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and coming to church and leaving feeling as though we were as powerless as when we came. We want victory, no longer defeat. That's what we desire. But beloved, there was a man in, in, uh, in Greece, Greek history, by the name of Alexander the Great. History calls him one of, the, one of the most amazing generals there ever was. And the men who followed Alexander the Great were encouraged and inspired by the spirit that moved Alexander. Alexander would let nothing get in his way and thus nothing got in the way of those who followed him. Beloved, let me tell you something. Our commander is one greater than Alexander. Our commander is one greater than any earthly general you can name. Jesus has never ever lost a battle. Can you imagine going into your fight, spiritually speaking, and every time the enemy comes to you, he comes defeated. Waking up to go into the battle, to go into the great controversy, knowing that every day is a victory. Beloved, it is impossible to be discouraged when you know the champion that you're following. It is impossible to be discouraged and to give up the fight of faith. It is impossible to become discouraged and to give ground to Satan when we understand the commander that we follow. His name is Jesus. And so tonight, we're going to be taking another look at that man. I want to inspire you by looking at Jesus. I want you to see him, and I want you to see yourself right there in him, and to understand that everything the devil has to throw at you, he threw at him, and he lost every Amen. single Amen. time. Have mercy. Beloved, if the father could do that through Christ his son, I wonder what he can do. <laughs> when he gets a hold of 144,000. I, I don't care if it's spiritual or if it's literal. Once he gets a hold of that people, God can do all over again to the enemy that which he did through Christ. Are we ready to stand fast in liberty? If we are, then we first need understanding. And so we go to our Bibles. We're going into our Bibles to review What the Bible says concerning the importance, concerning the importance of God's word. It says in John chapter one, in the beginning was what? The word. Pay close attention, beloved. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Whatever this thing called the word is, it was with God in the beginning and it is God. The Bible says the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Who is him? The word. All things were made by the word. And without the word was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. 
And that same word, beloved, was made to be what? Flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Now, who's the only begotten of the Father? In John 3, 16, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We know that text to be applicable to none other than Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of our eternal father. That's Bible. Now, the Bible says here concerning that same Jesus Christ, that he is the word that was in the beginning with God, his father. He is that word that was God with his father. He is that same word by whom all things were made. Beloved, pay attention to that point right there. Speaking of Christ, the Bible says all things were made by him. Who is him? Christ, the word. All things were made by Christ and without Christ was not anything made that was made. Now, why do I highlight that point? There are many who think that Christ is a created being. I've, I've, heard, I've heard some very uh, interesting uh, uh, doctrines and opinions, beloved, but what we want is the word of God. We want what the word of God says. Beloved, we have to understand, if Christ were a created being, this text here, one text of the Savior is not to destroy the other. It says, all things were made by Christ, and without Christ was not anything made that was made. Do you know that that means, if Christ were a created being, Christ would have to have been there to create himself in the first place? Now, beloved, I, I, I don't want to have to explain that that doesn't make sense. The fact of the matter is that anything that was created, Christ created. And the fact that Christ created all things and without Christ was not anything made that was made means that Christ is ever and always has been outside of creation. He is creator. He does, he's not a created being, beloved. He doesn't come in at some point in existence. He was in the beginning with the, word, with the Father and he was and is God. It's very important that we understand this point. I'm not going to exhaust it here. We're going to study it in a, in a further study together. But it's very important that we understand who it is we're dealing with when it comes to Jesus. Very important. There was an angel in heaven by the name of Lucifer who did not understand what he was looking at when he was dealing with the Son of God. And for the very reason that he did not understand, this entire great controversy has begun. Beloved, God cannot finish the great controversy with a people that are confused about his son. His son is the explanation of everything that, ends, that God answers in the great controversy. He is the express image of the father's person. And if there's anything we ought to get right, it is who Jesus is, not in a general sense, but also in a personal sense. Who do you say that Jesus is? The Bible says, speaking of that same word, Jesus Christ, Isaiah 55, it says, for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, the bread to the eater, so shall be my word, or so shall my word be, that goeth forth out of my mouth, it, pay close attention, beloved, it shall not return unto me how? Void. The Bible says that God's word will not return unto him void, but it shall accomplish that which he pleases, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto he sent it. Question. John chapter 1 says that Jesus is the word of God. That same word was made flesh, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. That is Christ. Christ is the word of God. But in Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11, the Bible says, speaking of that same word, that that word would not return unto God void, but it would prosper in the thing whereto the Father sent it. Now, what's interesting about this uh, quotation here, this text here, is in our last study, we saw that when Christ returned to heaven after Calvary, after the resurrection, when Christ returned to heaven, he did not return to his father void. I don't know if we remember, but we studied and we saw that God the Father has placed all of humanity in his son. This is why all of humanity can read the text, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. These words are true for every man because the Father has done something for every man. Now the question is, will any man respond with faith? 
God says, my word, Christ, my word, would not return unto me void. The Bible proved to us already that Christ did not return to the Father void, but he returned with you and I in him, and that is precisely where the victory is. We've been studying that we are well able to overcome in Christ. Now, the Bible says it shall prosper, the word of God, that is Christ, it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. The next question I have is what did the Father send his word? What did the Father send Christ to accomplish? Because if we can understand what he came to accomplish, then we know he has prospered. Because in the same way he does not return to his Father void, he went full with humanity, not empty, but full with us, amen? In the same way he did that, it is also true that he has prospered in the thing that the Father sent him to do. So the question is, what was the word to prosper in? We want it from our Bibles. In the book of Luke chapter 4, Jesus was speaking, uh, this is his first sermon here, in Luke chapter 4. And the Bible says, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, look at this, he found the place. Now, it's interesting. Everything in the Bible is, is, is intentional. There's a reason why it's written that way. The Bible says that the, the book of Isaiah was given to Christ, and he opened the book, and he found. If Jesus found the place, it implies that he looked for it, and he knew where it was. We're talking about following our example of Jesus Christ, even in Bible study. There is no way Jesus could open the book and find the place unless he knew where the place was, beloved. Some of us, were, we're still in church, and it's like, you know, the, the preacher can say to us, uh, turn with me in your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 100, and some of us would turn through our Bibles as though there were a Genesis chapter 100. Beloved, there's no such book, no such uh, chapter, rather. We need to know our Bible, even as Jesus did. It says here, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, Jesus closed the book of Isaiah, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on Jesus. And he began to say unto them, this day, notice how Jesus didn't wait for tomorrow. He said, this day, notice how Jesus didn't wait for the next Bible study. He said, present truth, presently, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Beloved, when we're studying the word of God, are we taking the word of God as a literal reality to us right now in this day? Because this day is the only day we have. We don't have tomorrow. It is not promised. Here in the Bible, it said that the spirit of the Lord was upon Christ because God hath anointed him. In the book of Daniel chapter 9 and chapter 8, you'll read about the 2300-day prophecy. As Seventh-day Adventists, we're very familiar with it. Uh, for those of us who are not, we will study that in the future as well. In the 2300-day prophecy, the Bible spoke of one known as the Messiah, that is Jesus Christ. But the word Messiah, beloved, in Hebrew, literally means the anointed one. Here in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is speaking in the context of his messiahship in the 2300-day prophecy. He is speaking of his mission as the anointed one. He says, the Father sent me to set at liberty them that are bruised. Beloved, are you yet walking in liberty? He says, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Beloved, is your broken heart yet healed? He said, I came to preach the gospel to the poor. Beloved, has your poverty yet been exchanged for the riches that is the man Christ Jesus? Because Jesus says this very day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. I want us to understand that if these things aren't uh, being applied by God's grace, if we're not receiving it right now, it would be better that we never opened our Bibles to begin with. Because Jesus says the power of the word is in the very day that you hear the word. When God said, let there be light, the sun, uh, rather, when God said, let there be lights in the, in the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars did not wait for 175 years before they came into existence. And yet as Seventh-day Adventists, we have been dealing and struggling with the same creative power, be ye holy, be ye perfect, even as your father in heaven is also perfect for over 175 years. The difference between us and all of creation, beloved, 
The difference between us and the sun, the moon, and the stars is the sun, the moon, and the stars did not have a will with which to fight the will of God. We have to choose to yield. Hmm. And when we yield, beloved, this very day is the scripture fulfilled in our ears. This very day, the gospel will give you the riches of Christ in exchange for your poverty. This very day, God will heal your broken heart. Somebody says, no, I don't, I don't believe that I can be healed of my broken heart because that thing happened so long ago and it's so deep. Beloved, with his stripes, we are healed. Why don't we believe the word of God? Now, the reason I'm talking to us this way is because I want us to understand there, it's very easy to think we believe. It's very easy to think we have faith, but, but what is faith? What is faith? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse one, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. We are hoping to be Christians. We are hoping to be free from sin. But the Bible says that faith is the substance. Beloved, faith does not wait for something more substantial. I want us to understand what I'm saying here. True faith does not wait for something more substantial. The word of God is enough. If God has said it, that creative power will make of me what that creative power says. The word of God does not work, wait for further evidence. Faith is the substance. Faith is the evidence. We believe and God supplies the fact. But it is impossible for God to supply the healing to your broken heart. It is impossible for God to exchange your poverty for the riches of Christ. It is impossible for God to deliver you from your captivity, to restore your sight to the blind, or to set you at liberty, though you are bruised, except you believe the word as it is. I want to share with you a very uh, beloved, this man here on the screen. Some of you may be familiar with A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner and the history behind these men. Beloved, when I, when I tell you, if it wasn't for men like A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagner, um, I, I would probably be dead off somewhere in the street somewhere. The message that these men brought, beloved, the, 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 the vision of Jesus, the way he was presented in the message that these men brought, beloved, it is the best news in the entire universe. Yea, it is the only news in the entire universe worth hearing. When you study Christ as presented by these men, as presented through the writings of, of Sister White, as presented and clearly uplifted by the life of Christ in the Bible, when you see this man, do you know it becomes impossible for you to want to hear anything else? I don't even remember what I used to preach before I learned of Christ in the light of this message, beloved. And I don't want to remember because everything with Christ in it has become so much better. Inspiration says that we were preaching the law of the law until we became as dry as the hills of Gilboa, preaching law and duty, but missing the heart transformation that only Jesus can bring. I don't want to stay there too long. A.T. Jones said these words, catch these words in a book called Lessons on Faith. If you've never read this book, beloved, this is a gem, please. Uh, uh, you can email me and I'll send you where you can get a book for yourself. Small book, powerful impact. Small book, powerful impact. He says on pages 10 through 12, the knowledge of what scripture means when urging upon us the necessity of cultivating faith is more essential than any other knowledge that can be acquired. In other words, beloved, the most important thing that I could ever share with you, the most important thing that the Spirit of God could ever teach you or I, is the necessity of cultivating, that is to grow, that is to exercise, that is to practice biblical faith. That is more essential than any other knowledge. There are ministers of the gospel, and I speak respectfully because I used to be one of them. There are ministers of the gospel who know more about the beast than they know about Jesus and the saving faith that comes by him alone. And beloved, that cannot save us. You can know everything about Bible prophecy. You can know everything. The Bible says you can speak with tongues, even the tongues of angels. But if you lack love, then we are nothing. Beloved, I want us to get to a place in our experience where we are not satisfied with the bare minimum. I desire for you above all things for you to get to the place in your experience where you know who you are and whose you are. 
Beloved, that is what we need to know at this time more than anything. Because there are people out there dying right now because they don't know that Jesus loves them. They've been to church, but the church members don't show them Christ and they leave the church hoping to find Christ somewhere out in the world. Beloved, when will we become living epistles? That knowledge is more essential than any other knowledge that can be acquired. Continuing, he says, faith is. Now, I, I, I like when, when, um, when the ministers of God begin to use words like this. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, when the apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is, he was getting ready to define the gospel. Here, A.T. Jones says, faith is, meaning he is going to give you the biblical definition of faith. Beloved, please catch this thing. Because when we ask one another, what is faith? It's easy to say faith is the, uh, the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. And yet there's no evidence in our life. There's no substance of victory in our lives. Because though we have the definition in word, we don't understand how to experience it. Here is the experience. Catch this. He says, faith is, number one, expecting that the word of God how? Itself. Beloved, I'm going gonna, gonna to read it again. I need us to catch this because he did not say the word of God with something else. He says, faith is expecting that the word of God itself will accomplish what the word says. And number two, it is the depending upon the word only to accomplish what the word says. Beloved, I want you to understand what A.T. Jones is saying here. I want you to understand, because I believe that if we understand what he's saying here, we have attained the more essential knowledge, that knowledge that is more essential than any other knowledge that can be acquired. I want you to acquire it right now. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time here. Faith is the expecting that the word of God by itself, it doesn't need any help, beloved. It's creative power. It is self-fulfilling. God's word does not need your help. When God said, let there be light, he didn't ask your hand to make light there. When God said, let the, 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 the sea bring forth animals and the sky bring forth this and let there be firmament, God did not need our help in producing those things. The word was enough. That is the purpose of the creation account. Beloved, do we understand that if Adam had learned that lesson, we wouldn't be in this problem? Eve goes and commits sin and comes back to Adam, and clearly that's a problem. Clearly that's a problem. But if Adam had looked at the creation account and remembered, before I could know anything about the cold, God made the sun. Hey. Before I could know anything about being homeless, God planted I mean the garden. Before I could know anything about being lonely, God gave me Eve. And before I could have any desire for anything, all was supplied. God I mean is the initiator of your life. And it is time that we live like we know it, beloved. Satan comes to us day by day, attacking us and destroying us. Do you know that if Adam had gone to Christ, the same way, and okay. said, Lord, I love this woman with all of my heart, but this is what she has done. I don't know what it is that you will do to save her, but I know that before I have a problem, you always told it. Please solve this problem for me. God would have taken care of it just as easy as he took care of any problem before it existed in the creation account. This is the purpose of the word itself. Okay, where is your mouth book at? What did she tell you to do? If we could just uh, mute our, our microphones. And if you wanted to mute us. Faith is expecting that the word of God itself will accomplish what the word of God says. Let me ask you a question. When the Bible says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and you read that word that you should have no other God before me, do you trust that that commandment has power in and of itself, if you believe it, to make that the reality of your life? Or do you at once seek to believe the word by adding to the word your own work? Do you remember when God said to Abraham and Sarah, uh, Abram and Sarai at the time, he said to them, you will be the father and the mother of many nations. I will give you your son Isaac by your wife, Sarai. And many years had gone by. Sarai was, was well beyond uh, childbearing years. Abraham, uh, you know, was an old man himself. And so Sarai came up with the plan that in order to fulfill the word of God, Please catch what I'm saying, beloved. In order to fulfill the word and the promise of God, we need to do something in addition to that word. Beloved, that's not faith. 
That is how Hagar got involved. That is how Ishmael was born. And that is the reason for many of the wars that we see going on out there in the Middle East today. The, the ripple effect is, is, is enormous. We need to learn to trust the word of God alone. If God has said it, I don't care how impossible it looks, the word will make it so. And A.T. Jones is telling us that faith is expecting that word itself to accomplish the task and depending upon that word only to accomplish what the word says. But we've seen from the Bible that the word is a person, have we not? The word is not just what we read, beloved. It is Jesus Christ who is the fulfilling of that word. A.T. Jones says to cultivate dependence on that word of God, the word only itself, to do what the word says, that is to cultivate faith. And understanding how to exercise faith in this way, this is the science of the gospel. The science of the gospel, beloved. It's amazing. And I say so respectfully. Uh, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I love, I love the church by God's grace. It is the apple of his eye. I find it amazing, beloved, that we can go to our schools and, and get PhDs and, 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 and all these things and doctors in divinity and never understand the science of the gospel. We need to learn how to exercise biblical faith. What does the Bible say? In the book of Exodus chapter 34, we were looking at how it was that Jesus was supposed to die for us. How was it? The Bible said that it is a part of God's character that he will by no means clear the guilty. That is in his character. And the fact that God changes not means that the fact that he clears not the guilty by any means, that would never change. And the conclusion we came to during our last study was that if that is so of God's character, then we must conclude that the sacrifice of Jesus on that cross was not some means by which God cleared the guilty. That was never the plan. In fact, as we studied, we realized and we saw that every guilty man, you and I included, were crucified with Christ on that cross. No man escaped. What I need us to understand is that Jesus was perfectly sinless in heaven. He was perfectly sinless on earth. He went back to the heavenly courts just as sinless as when he came in the first place. Jesus has never sinned. You and I, beloved, needed Christ in the same way that he needed us. Please, please catch what I'm saying here. Because it's not an irreverent thought to think that Jesus needed us in the plan of redemption. I'll explain why. In order for Christ to go into the grave, sin had to be on him. But seeing as Christ never committed sin, never would commit sin, he, he never yielded to sin, amen? It was impossible for the grave for Christ to go in there by himself and to stay there. It was impossible. So the father laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. Our sin was his ticket into the tomb and his righteousness is our ticket to the throne of God. Come on now. Our sin was Jesus's ticket into the tomb, but his righteousness is our ticket to the throne of God. Somebody says, Brother Paul, that sounds sacrilegious. Did you just say the throne of God? Did Jesus not say in Revelation chapter three, to him that overcome, will I grant to sit with me? in my father's throne, even as I have overcome and I'm sat with him in his throne. Yes, beloved, it is not sacrilegious. It is the plan of redemption. I know that it sounds too good to be true, but as I have told you before, it is too good, but it is entirely true. And it, we're living in a generation where we need to know what the truth is for ourselves because only the truth can make a man free. But continuing with this thought, we saw in Ezekiel 18 and verse 20, the Bible said of Christ, uh, said of the sinner rather, it said, the soul that sinneth, keyword, it shall die. Notice the Bible did not say the soul that sinneth, a substitute merely would come and die in his place. Many people look at the sacrifice of Christ and we see no more than a substitute. But the Bible said, if Christ were to die for any man, he must die as that man, because the soul that sinneth, it, the responsible party, it shall die. That is who dies, beloved. You and I have both committed sin. Now, the question is, have we died yet? Because the Bible says we're crucified with Christ, and some of us are, 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 are walking spiritualism. We speak about the true state of the dead, but we don't understand what it is to be dead, because if we're crucified with Christ, how are we still treating one another the way we do? If we are crucified with Christ, beloved, how are we still offended by that wicked thing that happened to us so long ago? 
Lord, have it mercy. is time for us to understand the true state of the dead in a new way. Not only that the dead know not anything, not only that all things are forgotten and their, their portion Come is on. under the sun, but you and I, dead in Christ, can no longer live with the old grudges, have live mercy. with the old jealousies, live with the old, the old gossips must be put away. This is what it means to be dead in Christ. And we, we saw from the Bible that Jesus has, in fact, met this requirement for every single man. And that means every single man ought to hear what we're talking about right now. Everybody. Do you understand that it is selfish for us to hear something like this and to know that this is true for us and not just for us, but for every man and to know any man that has not been invited to this thing? Beloved, I'm not saying they all have to be in this conference room. I'm saying we, we better take notes by the grace of God and go share it with somebody. Our neighbors are dying for lack of this. Our church people are dying in the pew right beside us because they don't understand the concepts we're talking about here. But the time is here where God wants us to go to every man. Hebrews 2 verse 9, the Bible says, but we see Jesus. That's all I see, beloved. And that's all I desire you to see. We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. Why? That he, by the grace of God, should taste death how? For every man. And we concluded that if Jesus tasted death for every man, but the soul that sinneth, it is that alone that must die, then Jesus had to have tasted death not only for every man, but as every man. Beloved, I don't want us to miss the significance of that point. Many Christians open their Bible, Christians, never mind the atheists and the non-believer, because they, they have their own understanding of this, but the Christian, beloved, we open our Bibles and we look at Jesus as though he's a savior afar, afar off. He doesn't understand what I'm going through, so there's no way I can practically pray to him and ask him for help. Beloved, Jesus has been there. I want you to see this for yourself from the Bible. The Bible says in Hebrews 7, verse 26, for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Now, what's interesting about that is if that's who Jesus is and Jesus became us, then do you know that holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens is precisely God's desire for you in Christ? It is impossible for you to understand what I'm talking about right now, what we're looking at from the Bible. It is impossible for us to see that Christ became us and to not realize that it is impossible to talk about Jesus and not see us there. Impossible, beloved. Anything that is for him, God has made it so that it is for you and I in him. This is what the plan of salvation has done. God, the son of God, my friend, brother, Michael Verla says this all the time, and I'll repeat him. The son of God became the son of man so that the sons of man could become the sons and daughters of God. Beloved, we better understand this gospel. This thing is so sweet. I'm trying my best to speak in, in, in solemn tones, but I, I, I can't help but allow a little bit of excitement to, to, to break through, beloved, because if we understood what it is we're reading here, we would go throughout our week with all of the anticipation of victory at every single moment. If God meant it for Christ, then God means it for me. The fact that the angels guarded his steps means that there's no room I walk into unguarded by the angels of God. If God answered his prayer and I abide in him, then there's no prayer, no tear that I can shed of which God is not immediately interested. Beloved, what is troubling you? That makes us think God is unaware or God is unconcerned. Beloved, we seem to think that God is not near. The message of Jones and Wagner is designed to help us see that God is not just near. He is very near. The Bible says that, that Jesus was with these men on the road to Emmaus, right there in front of them, talking with them. And they're talking to Jesus about Jesus and don't realize that Jesus is in their presence. Beloved, how blind we can become. Laodicea is wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. We don't even know it. Christ is in our midst even right now. Seeking to bring healing and peace and restoration. And more significantly, beloved, the victory. It is victory and it is peace that we need in Jesus at this time. The Bible said in Romans chapter 6, knowing this, not guessing, beloved, stop guessing. You better know this thing. You're a seven Adventist by the grace of God. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified, past tense, with him. 
that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. There it is. Do we understand it is impossible to debate whether or not we can have victory over sin if we understood what we just read? The Bible says that we're crucified with Christ. We all say amen. The Bible says that our old man is dead with him. We all say amen. Then the Bible says that those that are dead are freed from sin, meaning you can have victory over sin. And we say, whoa, 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 you know, you're going too far. No, beloved, take the word as it is or leave the word entirely alone. It is better for us to believe what Jesus says than it is for us to continue studying what Jesus says and, 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 and keeping the evidences against ourselves in the judgment because he has said these things to liberate us by the very same word. Faith is believing the word and expecting the word to do exactly what it says. So when we read that we are freed from sin, past tense, how dare we, I'm speaking respectfully, go back to the same way we treat one another in God's church. Beloved, do you know that inspiration says two-thirds of all of the problems that exist in God's church are caused by gossip? Two-thirds of all of the problems in God's church are caused by gossip. If we understood what we were studying tonight, beloved, it would be impossible for us to continue as we are. Every week, I get a new video on YouTube. Every week of some young person who has left the Adventist faith and has made a video uh, 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 declaring why they have. And every time I listen to what they're saying, beloved, I'm saddened because they never leave because of Jesus. They leave because of the people who profess to know the man. Do we know Jesus? Beloved, I, I need us to understand this evening. I'm not, I'm not speaking at you. I'm, as much as I'm saying this to you, I'm saying it to myself. I desire a deeper communion with Jesus, I desire that this freedom I read about here become my experience at every possible level. Because if that becomes true concerning you and I, then we can give the loud cry. The loud cry is going to be more demonstration than proclamation. The reason it hasn't happened to the extent that God wants it to happen yet is because the people who have the message don't yet have the experience. It is time. It is time to experience this thing for ourselves, beloved. We saw in the Ministry of Healing, page 89 in paragraph 3, that Jesus, by his own blood, emancipated the race. He signed the emancipation papers of the race, not of the Black man. Please catch what I'm saying, because there are some who would take the Bible and make it about the Black man alone. Not just the white man. Please hear what I'm saying, because there are those who do that as well. We're told that with his own blood, Jesus has signed the emancipation papers of the race. That includes every kindred, tribe, people, nation, language, color, whatever you wanted to divide yourself into, beloved, we are united in Jesus Christ. That is what the gospel means. It is impossible for us to look at us as anything but the purchase of God's blood when we know what it is that we have studied here. And sadly, many of us don't know what it is we've studied. I'm not speaking of us here. I'm speaking in a general sense. But by the grace of God, we're going to understand more and more. His becoming us has emancipated us. In other words, beloved, unless Jesus became us, there's no emancipation. There's no liberty to talk about. The, the, the power of the gospel is the fact that Jesus knows your experience. The power of the gospel is the fact that Jesus knows your experience and more than knows your experience, Jesus worked out perfect righteousness right there in your experience. This is a fact, beloved. I don't even argue this with ministers anymore. I used to, by the grace of God, but we don't do that anymore. Let the Bible speak for itself. So the question now is, how much like us was Jesus really? How much like us? Because if my freedom hinges on his becoming me, I need to know just how much he became me so that I can walk in that freedom. I want it all. What do you say? I want all the freedom that Jesus offers. And so the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 14, beloved, oh, beloved, <laughs> This thing says, for as much then as the children, the children are you and I, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. Two words, very key. We're going to take our time with this because I want us to understand what's being said. And I don't want us to, 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 to somehow get what's not being said. I want us to get what it says. In as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, that is Christ, himself, likewise took part of the same. Pause there for a moment. 
What the Bible is saying here is that Jesus, in the exact same way we are partakers of flesh and blood, that's the same thing that was true of Jesus. In other words, flesh and blood is not an excuse to continue in sin. Because Jesus came down and was a partaker of flesh and blood, not in any way, but in the exact same way that you and I are partakers of flesh and blood, and yet he was without sin. Let's continue. It says that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. For verily, hmm, beloved Father God, please. Help us to understand what it is we're seeing here right now. I, I want us to grasp this. This here, Lord, please, in Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, pay close attention to these words. The Apostle Paul says, For verily he, that is Jesus, Jesus took not on him the nature of angels. Stop right there. The Apostle Paul says, Jesus did not take on himself the nature, keywords, the nature of angels. Why did the Apostle Paul bring up the nature of angels? It's because he's about to contrast the nature of angels with something else that Jesus did take on himself. It's very important that you see this because many of us read this text and we read over it. We don't recognize it. The Apostle Paul says, for verily, Jesus took not on him the nature of angels, but in contrast, rather than the nature of angels, he took on him, keywords, the seed of Abraham. Now, if we're following the, 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 the sentence in its context, it begins to make sense bit by bit. The Apostle Paul is contrasting the nature of angels to the seed of Abraham. The seed of Abraham and the nature of angels are meant to be contrasted here. He didn't take on himself the nature of angels, but instead he took on himself the seed of Abraham. If you're reading it in context, what the Apostle Paul is saying is he did not take on himself the nature of angels, but he took on himself the nature of Abraham. Beloved, we have to see it in its context. He is contrasting the nature of angels to this thing called the seed of Abraham. And when you study it, you will see that the seed of Abraham is the nature of Abraham. Very important that we see this. Very important that we see this, beloved. I, I didn't even want to go into this in this study, but there, there were men in our denominational history. And, and we know that we were not against flesh and blood, but, 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 uh, Truth is a liberating. The Bible says, you shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. If truth liberates men, then error enslaves men always. Beloved, I cannot be silent when error is going around. There were men in our denominational history by the names of Leroy Froome and Anderson, who wrote a book that was known as Questions on Doctrines. Or it, had, it had a longer name, Seven Adventists Answer Questions on Doctrine. Beloved, in that book, in that book, was the erroneous view that Christ took on himself the sinless, please catch what I'm saying. In that book was the erroneous view that when Jesus came to this world, he took on himself the sinless nature of Adam before the fall. Now, my question is this. Did Jesus come to save sinless people or did he come to, to save sinners like you and me? He came to save sinners like you and me. Sinners like you and me, do we have a sinless nature or do we have a sinful fallen nature? We have a sinful fallen nature. So then if Jesus came in the sinless nature of Adam before the fall, how does Jesus reach a sinner like me? The Bible refers to what Jesus did as the mystery of godliness. Do you know that a mystery is something mysterious? I'm defining the word with the word, but, but excuse me. A mystery is something mysterious. Beloved, it is no mystery if a man with a sinless nature does not commit sin. If you have a sinless nature, you won't commit sin by the grace of God if you use your, 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 your choice the right way. It is a mystery when a sinful nature can still see righteousness produced in itself. We need to understand what is being said here. I'm going to say it very plainly, and then I'm going to allow the Bible to speak. Christ did not take on himself the sinless nature of Adam before the fall. That would not reach you and I. That's not what we have. Christ took on himself our sinful fallen nature. Now, in order to understand what I'm saying, there's something that needs to be said here. Having a sinful nature does not make somebody a sinner. 
Having a sinful fallen nature is not what makes you a sinner. I'm going to show you this right now. Having a sinful fallen nature is what makes it possible for you to be tempted. But having a sinful fallen nature does not make you yield to temptation, beloved. Only choice can do that. I'm going to continue reading here because I want the Bible to say it to you for yourself very, very clearly. Some of you may have never heard what I just said. I want you to see this from the Bible. The Apostle Paul says, for verily he took not on himself the nature of angels, but he took on himself rather the seed or the nature of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things. Beloved, I, I cannot say it plainer than the Bible. The Bible says, wherefore, in all things, it behooved Christ to be made like, not unlike you, beloved, but like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. In other words, it is impossible for Jesus to be a merciful and faithful high priest unless first he is like us in all things. I need you to catch this thing, beloved. I need us to catch this thing. It says, in all things uh, pertaining to God to make reconciliation to the people, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able. Stop reading. Beloved, I want us to see what we're reading here. It said, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able. In other words, Christ's ability to do what comes next hinges on the fact that he was tempted. If Jesus was never tempted like I am tempted, Jesus cannot save me from my temptations. And yet there are versions of the gospel out there today that preach a Jesus that is nothing like you and I. Beloved, we need to understand the gospel accurately from the Bible. It says, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, Jesus is able to secure. That means to aid, to assist, to help them that are tempted. In other words, beloved, if Christ was unlike you or me at any point of weakness or at any point of strength, then at that very point, you and I have no savior. I need to make this very, very clear. If there is any point of weakness in your experience that you can point to that Jesus did not suffer and overcame for you, then at that very point, you have no savior. Very important, beloved. The Bible says in John 15 and verse 5, I, now, now, I, I want you to understand what I'm saying here. I'll repeat what I said. If Christ was not like you at any point of weakness or any point of strength, if there was anything about you that is weak, you say, oh, well, Lord, I, I, I can't have victory over sin because I'm tempted. Jesus says I was tempted too, yet without sin. You say, Lord, I, I, I can't have victory over sin because I have sinful nature. Jesus says, while I did not work to get a sinful nature, I took your sinful nature and I clothed my divinity with it. And my divinity made your sinful nature behave. I have been there. There is nothing you can point to in your experience that can excuse sin in your life. I want us to mm. understand that Christ is a complete savior beloved i told you two uh two studies ago that jesus as a dying lamb was too much for the devil to handle what can we do with a living priest beloved we need to understand who it is that we serve if christ was unlike you at any point of weakness if christ had any advantages and strength that are not available to you then at that very point you have no savior but I want to show you from the Bible that Christ met every point of weakness. Christ brought his strength to every point of your weakness. And at every point of weakness or strength, you have a savior in Jesus Christ. I need you to see this. In John chapter 15 and verse 5, the Bible says, speaking Christ, Christ is speaking here. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth what? Much fruit. For without me, you can do how much? Nothing. Please catch this, beloved. I know some of the things I'm saying may be strange to some of us. That's why I'm repeating myself. Repetition deepens the impression. I will say nothing except I can show you from the Bible. I will quote nothing from the prophet of God, Sister Ellen G. White, unless I can first show you the Bible says the same thing. What the Bible says, the prophet says. What the prophet says, the Bible says. But I come from the Bible first. And this is why I'm spending so much time for us to see this thing. Jesus said, without him, you could do how much? Nothing. So that means the weakness that you and I have experienced is, is that in which we can do nothing of ourselves. 
So unless Jesus was put in a position where he could do nothing of himself, Jesus can't save us in the weakness that we have because our weakness is as such that without Jesus, we can do how much? Nothing. The Bible says he met us right there. In John 5 verse 30, Jesus said of himself, I can of my own self do how much? Nothing. Now question, beloved. When Jesus said, I of my own self can do nothing, do we understand he wasn't saying that he wasn't God? He was not denying his divinity. Jesus was speaking not as the son of God in that moment. He was speaking as the son of man. He was not speaking from his position of power. He was speaking from your position of weakness. And because he has been there, beloved, Jesus can bring strength right there to where you are. Going back, you say without Christ, you can do nothing. Praise the Lord. Christ says without my father, I of mine own self could do nothing. He came exactly where you are. He was able to do exactly what you can, and that is nothing of yourself. And in the same way we're dependent on Jesus, Jesus emptied himself, the Bible says, in such a complete way that the Father's life alone was demonstrated by Christ. Beloved, I, I, there are so many different texts that I can go to. We're winding down because it's 923. I know that we've been here for a while. We're winding down. I want us to understand that if you can point to any part in your experience where you are weak and you can't see that same weakness uh, 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 in the life of Christ overcome in your behalf, then you have no Savior there. But my Bible tells me, and I don't care what version you bring it, I, I prefer the KJV, praise the Lord. But if you come to me with the NIV, your Bible's going to say that. If you come to me with any of, any of these other uh, Bible versions that they're coming out with, the Bible will show you the same Jesus who meets you where you are and lifts you from precisely where you are every single time. We have to stop listening to the suggestions of Satan that we are so weak that we can't be made strong. We have to stop listening to the suggestions of Satan that we are so far that God is not nigh. Beloved, God does not wait for you to change your mind and come towards him. How do I know this? The Bible says that he is the lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. That means his commitment to your salvation predates your existence. Do you understand that? There is nothing you can do that can separate you from the love of God. Now, I did not say there's nothing you can do that cannot separate you from the presence of God. That's an entirely different story. Because at the end of the great controversy, those who reject this thing that we're talking about right now will find themselves without God and destroyed at last. Sinners, root and branch, all of them gone, separated from God. But even in the fact that they are separated from God's presence, they can never be separated from the love of God. Beloved, God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. We hate sin, errs, but love the sin. God is seeking to re uh, reverse that in our lives. And by beholding him, he will make it so. John chapter 14, we've covered the point of weakness. We saw that we can do nothing. And we saw that Christ put himself in a position and spoke as one who could do nothing. And he did nothing except by the Father. He met you there in your weakness. What about strength? Somebody says, Jesus had some advantages that I didn't have. Jesus was the son of God. Jesus was loved by the Father. Do you know Jesus says the Father himself loveth you? In John 14 and verse 12, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do what? Also, awesome. and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Beloved, we have to stop looking at the victory in the life of Christ as though Christ had some cheat code that is not available to you and I. That is not the truth. If it's for Jesus, it's for us. If you see it in the life of Christ, God expects it in your life. And the reason why in Colossians chapter three and verse three, the Bible says that Christ is our life. It is impossible to discuss you without discussing Jesus. It is impossible to discuss Jesus without discussing you. He has united himself in such a way. This is what Emmanuel, God with us really means. And I know that we don't understand the depth of it because if we understood the depth of it, our experience would be so much deeper than it is at this time. It's 926. I'm going to close out on this slide right here. And the next time we get together, we're going to go further into this because I want us to see from our Bibles a little bit more on that, that subject that I brought up on the nature that Christ took on himself, beloved. I want us to understand from the Bible that while Jesus took on himself our sinful fallen nature, we're going to see that from the Bible. It does not mean Jesus was made a sinner by that sinful fallen nature. There is nothing about sinful fallen nature that can make a sinner of Jesus because the mind he had was not the carnal mind. We're going to understand this, beloved. We're going to understand this. And Jesus affords us a better mind today, whereby we too may walk in the liberty of the sons of God. 
We're told in the Desire of Ages, page 24 in paragraph two, Satan, who is that beloved? The devil. Satan represents God's law of love as a law of selfishness. He declares, that is Satan, Satan declares that it is impossible for us to obey its precepts. I wanna say again, that any minister, any lay person, any Bible study that leads us to the conclusion that victory in Christ is impossible is directly declared from Satan himself. We need to understand this, beloved. It is he that declares that it is impossible for us to obey the law of God. The fall of our first parents, with all the woe that has resulted, Satan charges upon the creator, leading men to look upon God as the author of sin and suffering and death. Jesus was to unveil this deception as one of us. He was to give an example of obedience. And for this, for what? In order to give an example of obedience, for this, he took upon himself our nature. That's the seed of Abraham right there. We're going to go into what that nature is next time. He took upon himself our nature, and then he passed through our experiences. In all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Catch this point. Final point. If we had to bear anything, beloved, which Jesus did not endure, then upon that very point, Satan would represent the power of God, that is the gospel, as insufficient for us. Didn't we say that just a moment ago? That if there's any point in your experience where you are weak, the Christ didn't overcome that weakness, then at that very point, you have no savior? Inspiration says the same thing right here. It says, therefore, Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are. He endured every trial to which we are subject. And he exercised in his own behalf, how much power? No power that is not freely offered to you and I. As man, he met temptation and overcame in the strength given him from God. The very last sentence says, his life testifies that it is possible for us also to obey the law of God. Beloved, closing right here, I want us to understand when we're looking at the victory in the life of Christ, the victory was attained as a man dependent upon God. The victory that we see in the life of Christ was a victory that it was attained by a man dependent upon God. Jesus is God. Yes, we began in uh, John chapter one and verse one. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. But that same word became flesh. He became man. He entered our experience. So when we see Jesus living as a man, praying as a man, depending upon his father as a man, it is not to deny his divinity, but it is to amplify the fact that he came precisely to where you are in order to reach you. Many people use the humanity of Jesus as a reason to, dis to discard the fact that he has divinity. They throw away the fact of who he is, who he was before he became man, just because of how he speaks when he is a man. Beloved, we need to understand that when Christ became us, Christ spoke as us, Christ lived as us, he was tempted as us, by the grace of his father, he overcame as us. And it had to be so, not because he is not God, but because he must have come exactly to where we are. You and I in and of ourselves don't have divinity to get us out of sin of ourselves. And so Jesus could not exercise his own divinity. He was dependent on his father. He of his own self could do nothing because we, without Jesus, could do nothing. Beloved, I pray that it is abundantly clear. If it is not, that is all right. We are going to spend more time studying with each other and going into this thing. But when I tell you we scratched the surface of this thing, only the surface, beloved, um, by God's grace, as we continue to study together, we're going to unpack this thing even more. And the Lord is going to make it abundantly clear. I believe we're living in a generation where God wants us to understand this thing. We can understand this thing. And trust me, beloved, by the grace of God, all it takes is a willing heart submitted to the leading of the Holy Spirit.